Praise the Lord. Tonight, since we'll be observing the communion, we're going to have a message on healing. We're going to be dealing with the subject of the redemption of the body. Isaiah 53. Now we all know, at least we know here, that the atonement provided redemption for the whole man. Surely he has borne away our diseases and carried away our pains, and with his stripes we are healed, Isaiah tells us. The Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all, and so there we have both physical and spiritual healing promised. Now it's the healing of the body that's one of the greatest needs, perhaps the central need of the human race as far as physical aspects. The healing of the physical body is one of the greatest needs of the human race. No one has to tell you that because everybody has suffered from infancy this or that. And because of this, God has provided, promised in both Old and New Testaments that he would deliver his people from sickness. And so to limit redemption just to the healing of the soul or the inner man, as most churches do, including some charismatics. Well, it's really a threefold robbery. It not only robs Christ of a part of his work at Calvary, a part of what his sufferings and death procured for us at Calvary. If you don't appropriate healing, which is provided according to Isaiah 53, you're robbing him of a part of his work. Why suffer and die? for one aspect that the church for the most part ignores. So we're robbing Christ if we don't believe in the redemption of the whole man. We're robbing the believer of a very vital and necessary benefit provided in the atonement, which is physical healing. And then thirdly, to limit healing to the soul or the inner man is to rob the church of a part of its message. And so the church of our day can no longer confirm the word with signs following because they don't believe in the signs which are to follow, one of which, according to Mark 16, is the healing of the sick in the name of Jesus. And of course, this is taught throughout the New Testament. So God has promised it in both Testaments that he would deliver his people from sickness. I mean, all the way from Exodus to 1 Peter. And I dare say you'll probably find it in Genesis as well as Revelation because Abraham prayed for Abimelech and the wives of that nation because God had closed their wombs, you know, and there were no children being birthed, so that's a healing. So you can find it in Genesis. The truth of divine healing. In fact, except some of the faithful saints had preserved the truth of divine healing down through history, the church would have died long ago of just natural causes. But you know, I found the church of our day doesn't really believe its own message of divine sickness, that God sends sickness for their good and his glory. If they believed it, they would never go to the doctor, hospital, or take a pill or drugs because they would know that would be violating the will of God. And even if it's chastisement, you know. What I'm saying is they don't let their theology of divine sickness stand in the way of removing that blessing as quickly as possible. When they're sick and in pain, therapy replaces their theology. Doctors, their doctrine. Pills, their philosophy about divine sickness. And so if it all stopped with just the matter of their bad theology, I could say terrible theology because it's terrible. But if it all stopped with just their bad theology concerning sickness and healing, that would be serious enough. But it's the antagonism the hate, the open opposition to those of us who teach the biblical truth of divine healing that proves that they have, at least they're under the influence and control at this point, of the spirit of Antichrist. Now, what is it to be Antichrist about anything? Well, anything that opposes his work at Calvary or perverts it or twists it or robs him of what work he did there, to any extent, is anti what he did, anti-Christ. And anything that is opposed to what his word says, in this case we're dealing with healing, is anti-Christ. I mean, a child could see that. We're not trying to be 
harsh in saying that it's the spirit of Antichrist. In other words, when you are opposed to anything God says, or his work at Calvary, then at that point you're Antichrist. You see, you're being influenced and controlled. That's what we're saying. But I dare say with such hate and opposition and antagonism against this one doctrine, they'll let you speak in tongues before you know you teach divine healing. With such antagonism, I dare say it probably goes beyond just being influenced by Antichrist. It may be Antichrist. Even though they're professing Christ, yet they're Antichrist. If you turn over to Luke chapter 6, I want to read a few verses here in connection with what I want to share with you. I read in a religious paper, they had printed a sermon, a message from a minister I'm acquainted with. In fact, I've spoken in his church years ago. He was one of the early charismatics. And... In connection with what I want to say, I want to read a few verses here from Luke chapter 6, verses 6 to 11. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that Jesus entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day that they might find an accusation against him. I trust nobody came to church tonight to do that. We know spies get in occasionally. It's sad for you if that's what you were here for. Well, he knew their thoughts and said to the man which had the withered hand, Rise and stand forth in the midst. And he rose and stood forth. And then said Jesus unto them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? And looking round about upon them all, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored whole as the other. Well, if we saw that, we'd be jumping over the chairs. I mean, miracles never get old, do they? We've seen them, but they don't get old. But look at their reaction. And they were filled with madness. And communed how they might, you know, get rid of Jesus. Witnessing a miracle from heaven and filled with madness. And this brother, so say I'm acquainted with, who brought this message that was recorded in this religious periodical, he said that this scene was reenacted in a church that he was acquainted with when a minister friend of his who had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit was preaching one Sunday when he said one of his members, one of the members of the congregation, dropped dead of a heart attack, just fell over dead. And he said without thinking, this charismatic happened to be an Episcopalian, so you'll know it's high church and not Pentecostal. People say, well, that's the way the Pentecostals do. Jump down out of the pulpit. Well, he rushed down there, prayed for him, and God restored him back to life. The dead was raised. But the pastor who was telling this brother who was bringing the message, he said, I wasn't prepared, though, for the reaction of the people. Now, did people begin to praise the Lord because they had witnessed a miracle, a resurrection from the dead right in their church? Did a revival break out in that church, in that city, because of this miracle? I mean, did they begin to shout and praise the Lord because apostolic faith and power was being restored to the church today? By the way, they didn't know the pastor had the baptism. Were people saved in that church who saw that miracle from heaven? No, he said, I wasn't prepared for the reaction. They said, what in the world are you doing? You know we don't believe in healing in this church. And they threw him out. Just like here in the synagogue. Yes, they'll throw you out of churches today. The dead raised. Can you imagine that the professing church has actually come to the place where when they witness a miracle from heaven, one of their own members was restored back to them. They were filled with madness, just like we read here. Now, if you're filled with madness, when you witness a miracle from heaven, it can only mean one thing. You were filled with the devil before you were filled with the madness. <laughs> Anyone who opposes the message of divine healing has the spirit of Antichrist because he's opposing the work of Christ at Calvary. A person who opposes the truth of divine healing is opposing the word of God which teaches it. And at that point, you have, or you're being influenced by the spirit of Antichrist. You know, those are the Episcopalians. 
Is it any different when we read and hear of those charismatics who, for all practical purposes, speak about divine healing, but generally they mean by that you're to pray on the way to the doctor. Since they advocate and teach the one source, two methods doctrine of healing that you can't find in Scripture, one source, God is behind all healing. There are two methods that he uses, either medicine or a miracle, and you know which one that they look to and trust in most of the time. I'm talking about charismatics. They glorify in their writings and in their teaching. You can hear it and read it. They glorify the God of medical science. They're always patting him on the back and giving him an offering at his altar. And even teaching and practicing things contrary to the clear word of God concerning divine healing. There are some churches who actually practice medicine in the church. Now, that may not seem strange to people who have not been taught the word of faith, but there's that church in Florida I told you about once before that has established an inoculation program for the children. It's sponsored by the church, and the doctors who are members of the church are donating their services free, but what they're doing, they're having a clinic at the church and they're keeping a card file, a medical record of the children and their childhood diseases, and all they have to pay for is the cost of the drugs, and the church is sponsoring this medical program free. And then, not too long ago, I got a church bulletin. Someone sent it to me. I won't go into the church bulletins. That's not a ministry, as far as I'm concerned, folding church bulletins and passing them out, but... The title in part of the bulletin, the title of the article is, Hi, Meet Our Pharmacist. And then he goes on to tell how this particular pharmacist in this charismatic church has this ministry of discounting drugs to the members of that church or any other Christian. And believe it or not, there's actually a clip-off coupon on the bottom where you can save 10%. The church is advertising this. You can save 10% on your drugs to pollute your body with. I mean, you think you've seen it all until you see something else that comes out of the church of our day and of all places, the charismatic church. He actually says he's being directed by the Lord to do this. He believes that is a ministry. In fact, if you belong to that church, you get a 20% discount. The 10% coupons for your friends if they profess Christ. And on and on and on. Yes, we've come to the place where charismatics are practicing medicine in the church. So is that any different in the final analysis than a church, Episcopal or Baptist or whatever, that kicks its members out? We read you last week some articles of how the Baptist conventions and the Lutheran convention was not letting churches who were members of that particular area convention to send delegates to their meetings because they were practicing the heresy of speaking in tongues and faith healing, praying for the sick. Well, that's where we've come. And so are they any worse off when they have a program like this in their church than those who deny divine healing altogether? What's the difference? You see, this is supposed to be charismatic. They pray for their sick occasionally, but they'll send you to the drugstore to get it manifested with a 20% discount. And so, is the institutional church and its view of divine healing, which it opposes, can we condemn them and then charismatics who are supposed to know better, teach as one school of theology does out on the West Coast, that the minister is supposed to consider himself a part of the medical team? Of course, you know which part he is. He's never the head. That only leaves the other part, the tail, in Deuteronomy, we're supposed to be the head and not the tail, but in a medical team, the minister, he never does anything. He walks softly in those hospital corridors and is, yes, sir, Mr. Doctor. He may be a doctor himself, doctor of theology, but the minister, he said, is to be a part of the medical team, and of course, the part is always the tail part. And this is a school of theology, charismatic, if you please, that tells us that we ought to pay a visit to the doctor, have a medical checkup at least twice a year because we may be healthier than we think. Well, you might be. And he said that we should never say that we're healed until it's manifested because that's a deception. It's not honest to say you're healed before you receive the manifestation. Even then, he says, you're not to believe you're healed till you go get the doctor to confirm it. In other words, you can't even believe what is supposed to be the manifestation. 
Well, I don't know what he'd have done. Yes, I guess I do. If he'd been there when Jesus told the ten lepers, you're healed, go show yourself to the priest. And we read, as they went, they saw the healing was manifested and one rushed back to thank Jesus. Now, if he'd been there, he'd have said, well, now, Lord, you shouldn't tell them they're healed and go show themselves to the priest because, well, they may get worse on the way. One or two of them might die. And so they'll be deluded, you know, and thinking they're healed when they're not because that's exactly what charismatics are teaching today. I've had people, you know, tell me, you shouldn't preach so strong on faith because some people can't handle it and maybe they'll get off of their insulin or their medicine or their drugs and die on you. Well... As I told one man once, I'm sorry, there's not much I can do about it because Jesus already said it before me, and I'm just telling you what he said. Amen. That you're to believe you're healed when you pray, not when you feel better. I think that's Mark 11:24. Had this president of this charismatic school of theology been there when Jesus said in Mark 11:24, when he taught that, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive it, in this case healing, believe you're healed and you shall have it, Certainly he would have chided the Lord and said, Lord, that can be misleading. You should tell them to believe they're healed when they feel healed and when they see they're healed, when they have the manifestation, and not even then. Go to the physicians and have a checkup. Have him to confirm the fact that the manifestation is a true manifestation. And the man born blind, you know, and Jesus put clay on his eyes and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Oh, Lord, if he'd been there, he'd have chided him and said, that man's still blind. You can see he can't see. He's liable to stumble on the curb or fall down 10 flights of stairs and break his neck. This is what we hear all the time from so-called charismatics. Away with these non-charismatic charismatics is what I say. Amen. I mean, their bad, terrible theology is just as perverted an antichrist as the institutional system, which opposes the whole message of divine healing. No, if he'd been there, he would have chided Abraham too. If you follow his philosophy, then Abraham was not to believe he had a child till he saw him. And remember, there was 25 years between the promise and the manifestation. So if you follow his philosophy, Abraham should have sent Sarah to the doctors twice a year. She may have been pregnant and didn't know it. Send her to the doctors twice a year over 25 years. That's 50 trips. 25 years, and then when she gets the diagnosis, from the doctor, then she can believe. When the doctor said, Abraham, good news, your wife's with child. Abraham, now you can believe God. <laughs> That's what they teach. Believe it when you see it. Abraham saw that son for 25 years. Amen. That's how he received strength, and Sarah received strength to conceive. They claim to be charismatic, but they're non-charismatic. Because they're teaching and acting and doing exactly what the non-charismatics do about anything, anything, whether it's lawsuits, divine healing, or whatever. Some of them, you know, are even bragging they've got the baptism without speaking in tongues. Well, man's theology about sickness and how you get healed has resulted in so many misconceptions, so much confusion in the minds of the gullible and the unlearned. And you'll have people even ask you, well, doesn't the Bible say we're to suffer with Jesus? And of course, they imply by that you're supposed to be sick with him. Like 1 Peter 2, yes, it does say that. It says we are to suffer with Jesus. But read the rest of the passage. What are we to suffer with him? Well, we're told persecution, reviling, the opposition of those who hate the word, who have the spirit of Antichrist. Nowhere in the Bible are we invited to be sick with Jesus because he was never sick. And when we're to suffer with him, it doesn't mean sickness because he was never sick. Now, Jesus said that the devil will stir up men who will afflict you and oppose you and you'll suffer persecution. Some of you will be killed for righteousness sake. But nowhere does he say that the devil will stir up germs and diseases and sicknesses to afflict you with. And some of you will die of a disease for the Lord's sake. That's man's theology. Now, man actually teaches that. And you know it if you think for a moment. You've read it. You've heard it. Where somebody died, say, on the mission field. So he died serving the Lord. Because he died of a disease, that means he died in the faith. You've read about it. You've heard it. Well, poor old Dr. Jones. 
He'd only been on the mission field, I think, what was it, about three years when he contracted one of the diseases of the natives that he was treating and he died. But praise the Lord, he died in the faith. He was a martyr for the faith. He wasn't a martyr. He was a medicine man. If he had followed the word of God, he'd have gone out there without his medicine bag, his pills and his bones and his pieces of hair and feathers and all that garbage that the medicine men use, and he would have prayed for the sick. No, God never sent a medicine man out on the field to heal the sick by the miracle of medical science and rob Jesus Christ of his glory. He never sent a man out to heal people or try to heal them with drugs and cutting them up and mutilating them and polluting them with drugs and surgery. If he sends a man on the field, he sends him and says, go heal the sick cast out demons and say the kingdom of God has come to you. Not the AMA, American Medical Association, but it's a kingdom. See the miracle? That's the kingdom. Away with this bad theology. In another case, several men were killed in a plane crash. And one of those who was killed used to attend faith assembly. He sat under this teaching and he opposed the faith message. He didn't just oppose it. He criticized it openly. People told me that he was really strong in his criticism against faith assembly, including his message of trusting God for your finances. So he united himself with a group that practices the begathon, you know, to get money to support their programs and whatever. And on the way back from one of the begathons, they were all killed in a plane crash. And the write-up in this religious paper from this group, the headlines were martyrs died in service to the Lord. Martyrs? What an insult to the true martyrs down through history who were beheaded, who were burned at the stake, who were persecuted, who were drowned, who were sawn asunder. Read it in Hebrews 11 and read it in church history. What an insult to those who suffered all sorts of torture, some of them before they were killed, thousands of martyrs. What an insult to them to say that you're a martyr because you got killed in a train wreck or plane wreck or a car wreck while you were out on a begathon, begging for money, which is contrary to the word of God to begin with. You want to read about martyrs over in Acts chapter 7. There you'll see Stephen is killed. Over in Acts chapter 12, there you'll see James is martyred. And Stephen was stoned not because he was begging for money, but because he was preaching the Bible. And so with James, he was slain with the sword because he was faithful to the Word of God, not because he was out trying to raise money for a TV or radio program. If God wants a martyr, he will see that his death is the same as it's been all through history, as well as in the Bible, for righteousness' sake. Now, there's still a lot of misconceptions about divine healing. The sickness healing question, and we would be less than honest with you. We would be naive ourselves if we didn't say that some of these misconceptions are still held in faith assembly. And the reason is, is because we get new people in all the time who bring in the misconceptions. Then we've got people who are not doing their homework as they should. Maybe like tonight, they haven't really been listening as they should. They're here, they're hearing with their ears, but not with the inner ear. And so what we're going to be saying is instruction, not criticism. Take it as instruction. Why should I come out to criticize? If I'm going to come out, I want to bless you. I want to minister to you. I want to build up the body of Christ. So what we say are examples right out of this body. But I change the details enough that no one can get embarrassed, but everyone can apply it to himself or herself. They can say, oh, that must be I. Yes. You wouldn't say me if you want to be correct English, but it is I. That's what Isaiah said. Here am I. He didn't say, here's me. But <laughs> it's not criticism. But dear friends, we have to point out where some are making confessions that don't line up with the Word of God. Or sometimes they may want a prayer of agreement by the body, but... The body, if it's really on its toes, can't make that agreement because what they're asking or what they're saying doesn't line up with the Word. 
Now, our purpose is to bring us into perfection, into maturity, so that every time we stand up here, we recognize we've got the same responsibility as any minister. Whatever comes out of our mouth, where it's a testimony, asking for prayer of agreement, confession of faith, whatever, that it lines up with the Word of God and the teaching of faith assembly. So that's the motive behind it. We trust that the Holy Spirit will impress that upon you. I'm just pointing out some things where there's some areas showing misconceptions about how to appropriate healing for yourself or for others, where there has not been the right confession made for yourself or for others, and that sort of thing. So first of all, don't ask for the church to agree with you for a healing of a professing Christian who has been given the truth of divine healing by you and others or others, and yet they not only reject it, but often we find they are opposing the truth of divine healing. And so don't ask the church to agree with you that a person is going to be healed in spite of the fact they're opposing the truth of divine healing. Now that doesn't mean that's closing the door to getting them eventually healed because we've taught you faithfully how to appropriate things for others as well as for yourself. If one door's closed, there's always another door open, you know, if you're meeting the conditions. But we're saying here, this is a professing Christian, may be or may not be, who opposes the truth of divine healing. You've carried it to them. I don't want that faith book. I don't believe in that. No, get out of here. That's the devil's doctrine. Well, don't ask the church to agree that they're going to be healed anyway because they won't. Now, Matthew 18, 19 where two are agreed as touching anything they ask on the earth, it'll be done for them by their Father in heaven, will work. Where a person is not fighting the truth of divine healing. That would be true of any promise. We're limiting it to divine healing. When you come and stand in proxy, that will work when you're releasing faith for a loved one. We've seen these things happen time and again. There's no question but what they work. But you see, if they're opposing the truth of divine healing, and yet people will come and ask the church to agree and say, well, I just want you to agree with me because they're opposing this, they're fighting this and all that, but I'm going to believe anyway and I want you to believe with me. Well, if you've got that kind of faith to overcome opposition to the Word of God just by saying they're going to be healed because you believe it, you don't need a prayer of agreement. Just go ahead and believe it. Now, that doesn't close the door, but what you should do is Pray, and you can ask the church to agree with you on this, that God will open their mind to see the truth of divine healing, because it takes faith to be healed, friends. We'll say more about the apparent exception later. We've already said that we can agree for somebody that doesn't even know you're agreeing for them, for healing, or marriage restored, or deliverance, or whatever. We see these things happen, but when they're fighting it, when you've taken them the truth and they fight it, then there's another approach, and that is to claim that God will open their eyes and they'll see the truth wherever they need the truth, and that will happen. You see, you have to deal with the cause of their sickness, and when they're opposing the truth, they have a bad heart. They may have a bad physical heart you're wanting to believe for healing for. But you see, the heart of hearts, the spiritual heart's bad. Ask God to open that heart. And God does. Oh, God wants to bless your loved ones. He wants to save them. He wants to heal them. But you have to approach it right. You can't tell us somebody's fighting the faith message and just, well, God's going to heal them anyway because I believe it. No, it doesn't work that way. So we're trying to instruct you. And some, you know, ask for that. Here's another thing. You should not make a public confession of your faith for someone. Let's say this time the person's unsaved before they were professing Christians. You should not make a public confession of your faith for someone who's unsaved and get up and say, as we've heard, well, he is healed by Jesus' stripes. No, that kind of healing is only for God's children by the stripes of Jesus. Now, there are ways to get healing for an unsaved person. That's another subject. We'll get to it in a moment. But you can't get up as we've heard people say, well, they're unsaved. I've claimed their salvation. They're going in for an operation. And praise God, I believe it. They're healed by Jesus' stripes. No, healing by Jesus' stripes is for God's children alone and only His believing children at that because most of them don't believe in divine healing. You see, John 9 tells us that God will not hear sinners. And so if you get up and say you're going to believe they're healed in an unsaved condition by Jesus' stripes, then what you're actually 
implying or suggesting is God is going to make an exception in your case and bypass his own word. When he said in John 9, I don't hear the prayer of sinners. When he says in Psalm 66, 18, if you regard iniquity in your heart and every unsaved person is loaded down in his heart with sin, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God will not hear you. And God tells us in the book of Proverbs that even the prayer of a disobedient person who doesn't obey the word of God is an abomination to God. And so, again, this does not mean that you are shut up to the fact that this unsaved person, let's say it's your father, mother, husband, son, whatever, can't be healed. But what you should do is claim their full redemption. Start with the salvation. Say, now I'm claiming their salvation, and you can add baptism of the Holy Spirit if you're of a mind to. I'm claiming full redemption for that person. But don't imply that they're going to be healed by Jesus' stripes. You see, God's got ways to heal people without healing them by Jesus' stripes. That is the work at Calvary. Apparently, most have never thought of that. Why, he just prevents them from dying, and he lets the natural processes of nature take over. And all of those things inside of you that he's built into the human race, like when you cut your finger, you don't have to run to a doctor. You wouldn't even have to pray. You didn't before you got saved. And you watch that thing heal up over a period of what? A few days. So God can use processes preserving that person's life without applying the blood of Jesus to that situation. I'm just saying really what's obvious. I'm not trying to discourage you. If you've got the kind of faith that can claim this or that for unsaved loved ones, you just go right ahead. That's between you and the Lord. But don't get up and make a confession that implies that a lost person is healed by Jesus' stripes. He is in the business of healing people by his stripes, first of all, but first of all, saving them. Then they enter into the benefits of that covenant, which includes physical healing. Oh, physical healing is important. It's one of the central needs of the human race. But I'll tell you, it's quite secondary compared to spiritual healing. You see, so we've got to get them saved first. Don't say they're healed by Jesus' stripes. Now, this happens... I suppose confessions like this by people who are relatively new in faith assembly and they don't know the vocabulary of healing and faith in the Bible. But it's not always new people because I hear the testimonies. I don't miss a testimony or prophecy and they bless me. We're only talking about 1%, but the 1% is what the people out there hear. You see, who say faith assembly, oh boy, that's the kingdom of God on earth. You know, that's their statement they think everything is absolute perfection here and then they hear somebody get up and make these out of line with the word confessions and they say well i don't know i was thinking about moving up there but they sound about like the place that i'm in now it's charismatic the one percent's what they remember not the 99 percent of the good confessions anyway i hear them all and i'm blessed by them but we catch these things we're not looking for them they're just there and they should not be in faith assembly. And it's because some people are relatively new, but it's because some people are not doing their homework. Now, here's another thing. You shouldn't say as one person did, and it doesn't matter whether it's a man or a woman because we change these enough that no one gets embarrassed. But you shouldn't say my brother, and it might have been the mother, you see. See how I change things? You shouldn't say my brother is going to have to go into the hospital, unsaved, unbelieving, Christian who doesn't believe in divine healing, whatever. My brother has to have surgery in the hospital. When he told me about it, I claimed that the operation would be a success, and it was. And one day, that operation, that healing through surgery is going to result in glory to God. Now, we've actually heard testimonies like that in the church, and we hear 25, 50 people, I'm trying to keep the numbers down, saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. Now, if you haven't already caught how that's out of line with the Word of God, we can start all over and say, the message tonight is redemption of the body. We'll start all over if we have to. If you miss that one, we ought to start over. I'll say it again. My brother, unbelieving, at least in divine healing, had to go into the hospital for surgery. I claimed that the surgery would be a success, and it was. And praise the Lord, one day that healing through surgery is going to issue in the glory of God. How in the world could a healing through the God of medical science, which is totally opposed to the way that God heals, in fact, 99%, well, let's make it 95% of your doctors oppose the truth of divine healing. 
I mean, they fight it tooth and toenail. How in the world can a healing received at the hands of the God of this world glorify the God of heaven when that kind of healing is totally opposite to the way that God heals? He doesn't heal through surgery and blood transfusions and pollution of your body by drugs. We've been over it and over and over. Just go out and do yourself a favor and buy you a book written by the doctors and surgeons that say the worst place to go when you're sick is the hospital. Let them touch you. That's what the doctors are saying. Thousands, not hundreds, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands every year mutilated, crippled, killed through drugs and through surgery. Just read it for yourself. You can go that route if you want, but God is working against himself. He's healing through those mutilators because he's losing too many patients. He'd be working against himself. We're not mad at you. We just get a little loud for emphasis. It's called the anointing. How in the world is God going to get glory when he wasn't even consulted in the matter? Oh, my it doesn't mean, now you see, here we are again. Here's the other side. It doesn't mean you can't pray for their healing. Pray that God will preserve them. But start with the full redemption. If you're going to get up and tell us about it, say, I've claimed their salvation. I've claimed their full redemption. And I believe God's going to keep them alive until they're saved and baptized in the Spirit. See, then He can preserve them through that operation. And let the natural processes take over. And whatever and however he wants to do it. But don't imply it's the blood of Jesus doing it. Or that God's going to get glory out of it. No, one day, if God is glorified, that person will stand up and say, What a fool I was to trust in medical science. Well, I just thank God he preserved me through that operation. But I want to say I'm ashamed of myself that I trusted in the God of this world instead of the God of heaven. That will glorify God when you admit you missed it. We labor here in the Word and in doctrine, not just myself, but the other ministers, to teach you God's ways and how to make a confession that lines up with the Word of God. So, dear friends, I'm admonishing you, do your homework. Listen seriously to these messages on healing, since we're talking about healing tonight. And before you jump up to glorify God with your testimony or ask us to agree or whatever, think even pray. Will this glorify God? Is what I'm going to say in line with the Word of God? Now we as ministers have that responsibility. Why do you think you shouldn't have it? That's right. Before you jump up, you should say this is a solemn responsibility because every time somebody gives a testimony, and most of them are good, you hear amens, hallelujah, praise the Lord, glory to God, oh, praise the Lord. Now, a lot of you have discernment and you don't praise the Lord on some of these confessions out of line with the Word of God. But you should say to yourself, I'm going to get some praises to the Lord. I'm going to get some amens. I'm going to get some hallelujahs. That means those people are believing it's the way I say it and that's the right way. So you have a great responsibility. You've got as much responsibility to give a testimony, make a confession of faith about anything you're believing for as I do when I stand here to teach you. And I'll tell you, it's a tremendous responsibility. It's a heavy burden. Well, here's another thing that we want to instruct you about. We've taught you about the power of prayer in the Spirit in time of need or what the world calls an emergency. And sometimes about all you have is a few seconds to get that prayer and the Spirit out, and that'll preserve you. Sometimes the time is so short, all you have time for is one word, Jesus, or the blood of Jesus, or just the blood, because God knows whose blood you're talking about. You're not calling on your own. You don't want to see it when the car is going over the bank. You're not saying the blood like you're going to spill it. And sometimes, you know, that's all the time you have. Just like, well, the brother where the plane couldn't land because somehow it lost their hydraulic flood. So he unashamedly just got in the aisle and began to pray in tongues, down on his knees. He didn't care what people thought. And as he was praying in the Spirit, he said the Lord gave him a vision and saw all of those tubes and hoses and valves and so forth filling up with hydraulic fluid and he said it wasn't long that here came the word over the intercom we don't know what happened but we got pressure 
we've got flood where we had none, and they went on and landed. Well, you see, he had to do something in a hurry. And like the one man, charismatic, who said that he went over a hill and there there was an accident or whatever, and the cars were all backed up. And so he stopped, but he was near the rise of the hill and he said he heard a semi coming in back of him. And of course, he just barely got stopped with his pickup. And he said he could already see what was going to happen. That semi could never stop and it didn't. So he went on into the ditch and he said the semi came in on top of him and crushed the cab down. He said all he had time to do was shout Jesus and he said he'd no sooner uttered the word and, and stopped one inch from his head. So there's power in prayer, Amen. in the Spirit, calling on the Lord. And yet occasionally we get testimonies that don't reveal that they've heard all of this faithful teaching week and month and year after year like one and he's no longer still here so I won't change the details he got up and he thought I guess he was giving a testimony to glorify God and he said they were driving down the highway in their big Cadillac and blam a deer ran out in front of them and just about totaled the car and he said I started hollering help help and his wife had presence of mind enough to say the blood of Jesus and they got straightened out and no injury I guess he thought he was glorifying God. Help, help, you should be hollering hallelujah, hallelujah, or something besides help. <laughs> and yet he sat under this teaching, well, for years. Now you tell me how that glorifies God. He should have left all of that business about himself out and just said, my wife said the blood of Jesus and we got through it, then go home and repent about himself. <laughs> and in another case, and again, I changed the details a little, but Here's a case where a person got up and testified how the gas pedal stuck on the floor of the car. Remember, that isn't actually what happened. If I told you what happened, I'm embarrassing the brother. But the gas pedal stuck on the floor of the car and he couldn't get it loose. He was going down this mountain hill and the first thing you know, he's doing 90 or 95. In giving the testimony, here's his words. I didn't have any time to pray. I just had time to get that thing stopped before we all got killed. There were other brothers in the car with me and maybe they prayed, but I didn't have any time to pray. You didn't have any time to pray? That's when you don't have any time to do anything but pray. Amen. And that brother's been in this church for years. And yet I heard amens, praise God, you know, because the car got stopped. <laughs> they missed the fact that it was a terrible testimony. What do you mean you don't have time to pray? Because we preach and we've given, oh, I'm sure hundreds of illustrations about how the name of Jesus or prayer in the Spirit. And that's the thing that does spare your life. When our car went over the embankment in South Dakota way back years ago, we were hit at 65 miles an hour before the speed limits. And that thing went over the embankment and tried to turn over. And another time recently in Colorado, and I went to sleep and it went over the embankment. No power, no way to control it. We didn't have any time to do anything to get the car righted and stopped and spare our lives. We just had time to pray, and that's what we did. Oh, the blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. You get it out two or three times, and the car stops. Twice that's happened. That's the last time I'm confessing it. <laughs> For that little trial, I don't need it. Now, here's some recurring symptoms I want to deal with. Recurring symptoms of the disease of the doctrine of divine sickness that you contracted when you got in contact with those who were sick with this disease, namely the denominations. And like malaria, people who have malaria, you know the symptoms sometimes recur. And so here's some reoccurring symptoms. And the reason I want to deal with these before we get to the communion is because you probably think these would never apply to you. But like malaria, and I'm using a figure, you can get healed from that too, permanently, but like malaria, you see, you may not think you need some of these things we're going to say, but in time of a real trial, you've been three months and you've been hurting and you're not any better, but you've rather grown worse, then some of that poison you picked up from those who had the disease of the doctrine of divine sickness, that poison starts seeping up into your mental faculties and you start saying things that you wouldn't say ordinarily. You wouldn't say if it was your brother sick, you tell him, hold on, hang in there. But it's you. It's been six weeks, it's been three months, it's been six months, it's been whatever. And so these are some things, if you think about it for a moment, 
The devil uses this to delude and deceive you, these thoughts. First of all, well, it's been three months. I've prayed. I've claimed it. I've been anointed with oil. Maybe there is something that I don't see. It could be for God's glory that he's allowing this. It's going to issue in God's glory. It's going to issue in God's glory. Well, my Bible says in Acts 10, 38, that that sickness that's on you is the oppression of the devil. Now, there's one thing for sure. Since the devil's getting glory out of your sickness, God can't get glory out at the same time. How can you have God and the devil getting glory out of the same thing? Amen. That's impossible. I don't care what it is. Impossible. And you see, in time of that severe trial, you wouldn't think of that tonight, sitting here, feeling good, healthy, teeth brushed, hair combed, looking good. <laughs> oh, well, that one, we can skip that one. Well, three months later... I wonder, I wonder what God's trying to show me. He's trying to show you just to hang in there, hold on, believe. Amen. Healing glorifies God. I've got it marked down here, Mark 2, verses 1 to 12. I don't have to read it because you're all familiar with it. You can probably quote it. It's a man sick of palsy, born of four, carried in. And down after you read the account, they were filled with madness again. When Jesus healed the man sick of palsy, he said, Arise, take up your bed and walk. We read in verse 12 that all the people began to glorify God. Now we don't have a verse here that tells us they were glorifying God for that sick man. When they saw him, they began to glorify God. Oh, look how helpless he is. It takes four men. They have to tear up the roof to let him down. And every time they would see him, his neighbors praise the Lord. Look how sick he is. He can't even walk. They could only praise the devil for his sickness, but when he was healed, we read it. You read it. If you're a visitor here, even a spy, go mark down Mark 2, verse 12. And it's healing that glorifies God. Put that in your paper. Mark 2, verse 12. Just being a little facetious. But it's true nevertheless. Psalm 15, verse 12. God says, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you will glorify me. God gets glory out of deliverance, not leaving you on that bed of affliction. Anyway, the Bible calls sickness oppression, Acts 10, 38. Calls it bondage in Luke 13. Bondage by demons, a spirit of infirmity, Luke 13. The Bible calls sickness a curse, Deuteronomy 28. So how can Christians allow the devil to delude them into thinking it's a blessing, that it may somehow glorify God. Well, it isn't manifested yet. Maybe God will get glory out of this because it's taken so long to get manifested. If he'd manifested that the night that brother so-and-so prayed for me, well, they would have clapped their hands and then they'd wait for the next one, see them get healed. And forget me, but my, it's been six months. No, God isn't going to get any glory by you waiting, you'll just be there another six months thinking that way. Oh yes, God will get glory in your healing, but don't think that the delay of your manifestation is to bring glory to God. Just get that out of your head. If God wants to delay it, if he waits 15 years or 20, that's another thing. That's his side. You're to believe not you'll get healed sometime, but that you're healed when you pray. And look for that manifestation every morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, here's another thing you want to be on guard against. When you're going through the trial, it doesn't mean much when you're reading about it in a book or someone else is sick. But the devil can convince people who ought to know better that, well, maybe the reason I'm not healed is God is going to use this to bring my family in. I've claimed them. My husband, my wife, my son, my daughter, my mother, my father. Maybe he's going to use this to get them saved. Well, again, that doesn't line up with the Word of God, but you see, if you've been lying there for three months or if you've been battling this thing, say, for a year waiting for the manifestation, and we're talking to people who know that happens. We've already given you examples, like Abraham waited 25 years for a manifestation. You say he wasn't sick. Well, there are others sick in the Bible that didn't get manifested right away. We told you about the ten lepers and others. You see, to say that God is going to use this to bring your family in is trying to add works to your faith. You see, you don't read in the Bible where anyone ever glorifies God and gets people saved by their sickness. Like Dorcas in Acts chapter 9, she got sick and she died. And you don't read there of anybody that got saved. When Peter went in and 
through faith raised her from the dead, we read in Acts 9.42 that many, because of this miracle, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus' sufferings, I'm saying, are sufficient to provide you with healing. He doesn't need the addition of your sufferings to get anyone saved. That would be adding works to faith. You should reread Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, because there we have the principle that it's by faith and not works, lest any man should boast in salvation. The principle applies to healing or anything else God promised. It's by faith and not works, lest any man should boast. Well, then others, and these are things that the devil tempts you with, saying, well, I have prayed for my healing, and it still isn't manifested yet. I wonder, I know what they teach at Faith Assembly, you say, but I wonder if it's always God's will to heal his children. Well, when you start thinking that way, you're only implying or telling us the way it is that you've never read the Bible or you haven't listened to the messages from this pulpit. Is it always God's will to heal? Well, then read the Bible and you'll see that it is. James 5 says it is. The prayer of faith will heal the sick and the Lord will raise him up. Mark 16 says it is. We can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Mark 11, 24 says it is. When you pray for healing, believe you're healed and you shall have it. Psalm 103, verse 3 says it's God's will always to heal because he forgives all your iniquities. He heals all your diseases. He didn't say sometimes. He said all of them. Isaiah 53, Matthew 8, 16 and 17 1 Corinthians 12, there are a lot of passages that tell you it's God's will to heal. Now, it may be that you're not following James 4 as you should, because he tells us there in James chapter 4 that some do not receive an answer to prayer or do not receive from God because they don't pray. You say, well, I've prayed. But in this case, you see you've prayed the prayer of doubt and not the prayer of faith. So you have to go back to chapter 1 of James and verse 5 and reread the book before you get over to chapter 5 about healing. He tells you in chapter 1 that if you don't pray in faith, you won't receive anything from God. He tells you in chapter 2 that faith without works is dead. He says in chapter 3, you have to watch what you say with your tongue because you see, you could confess the negative. Well, it must not be healed because it don't feel healed yet. And then he tells you in James 4, you don't have because you don't ask. Then in James 5, he tells you well, he gives you five conditions to meet over there. The book of James is filled with instructions about healing or whatever God has promised. And so if you think it's not always God's will to heal, and it isn't in your case, it isn't everybody's case, every believer's case, but yours. If you think it's not always, you're right there. It's not for you. But thinking that. Then others say, and we've heard this before, we're told to give thanks for everything. And so that would include my sickness as well as my health. Well, that's why you're not healed. This is a hindrance. That's that disease of the doctrine of divine sickness seeping up into your consciousness again. Because nowhere in the Bible does it tell you to give thanks for your cancer. I mean, if you follow that philosophy, then if your husband runs off with another woman, give God thanks for it. If your daughter commits suicide, thank God for it. If your son dies on drugs, thank God for it. If your house burns down, you lose all you have, and you have to go on welfare, thank God for it. There's nowhere in the Bible that God tells you to give him thanks for those adversities, not for them, but in everything, give him thanks. In the trial, in the test, claim a promise, believe him, and thank him that he's faithful and his word is true. Now, the only place I know in the Bible where we're told to give thanks for everything is in Ephesians 5, 18 to 20. And there, if you read the context, you'll see that we're giving thanks because of good things and blessings. You know, the spiritual songs and the psalms and all of that. He says, in that context, for everything give thanks. Well, obviously, he's not in a context of sickness and losing your loved ones and all that. In everything you give God thanks. And so finally and lastly, we have people say, and you can say it here, if it's your trial, well, maybe it's too serious. I know what they teach at Faith Assembly. I know what the Word of God teaches. But after all, this is thus and so, and then they'll name it. You know, to some people, everything's fatal if the doctors can't help you. I mean, they just think that way. Too serious? And you say, well, 
it isn't just one thing. I think I've got at least a dozen things wrong with me. Well, then you've got a dozen reasons for believing God will heal you. You got a dozen things wrong with you? You've got a dozen reasons for believing God and the promise of healing. Because he says in his word, he'll heal all 12 of those things. Amen. Where? Psalm 103, verse 3. He forgives all of your iniquities. He heals all 12 of your diseases. And it's too serious. Is your condition more serious than the woman with the issue of blood? I think not, who had suffered many things at the hands of many physicians. There's medical science. Suffered many things at the hands of many physicians. Was nothing better, but rather grew worse. She had spent all she had. Are you worse than she is? Are you worse than the ten lepers? Have you got something worse than leprosy tonight? I don't think so, where your fingers and noses are dropping off and toes. Are you worse off than Hezekiah who was dying? Or how about Dorcas and Lazarus who actually did die? I don't think you're worse off than them because you're still here. Are you worse than the man sick of palsy that had to be carried around on a pallet before men? Are you worse than that man that lay at the gate beautiful who had been lame from his mother's womb to whom Peter said, silver and gold have I none? And he wasn't confessing poverty. He was making a point. I'm not going to give you money, but I'm going to give you something better. I never read of Peter starving to death, but we don't want to digress on that. Are you worse than that person? Are you worse than the woman dying of cancer who heard one of our tapes on faith a hundred times so she wore it out and then wore the cancer out? By listening that long to it, she got faith in her heart. Are you worse than her? Are you worse than the people with MS that we've seen heal? Are you worse than the retarded children that where parents are believing for them, they're seeing them come out of that? Are you worse than... Well, any testimony of healing that we've given you in this body over the years, if you're not worse than the lepers, the woman dying of cancer, the woman with an issue of blood, the dead, then there's hope for you. If you're not worse than they are, if you're worse, well, we'll have to investigate your case. Everybody thinks my condition is worse than anybody else's. Well, then that's just all the more reason to believe God because the doctors can't help you. And we can't help you. I mean, we may pray for you, but it's God who will do the healing. So praise God. If you think your case is so bad that the doctors can't help, then we know one, not only who can, but will. If you believe him and trust him. Well, these are forms of poison that you need an antidote against, and that's the word of God. Because, listen, I've gone through trials. I hear the same little old impish voices from the pit. Sometimes the devil himself telling you, you're not going to make it this time. What if you drop dead? You know, I stood here and preached to you, suffering a heart. I won't call it a heart attack, chest pains. You know what the devil was saying between my sentences? What if you don't make it? Then you'll lose all the people. Well, of course, if I didn't make it, I don't know if that would make a lot of difference to me, would it? <laughs> I've already lost you when, boom. Well, you know, if a person fell over in a faint, surely this church wouldn't be like a non-charismatic church, that Episcopalian one, or these charismatics who believe in, is there a doctor in the house? Surely there would be somebody in the church would run up and do like this Episcopal pastor did and rebuke the spirit of death and watch that brother or sister rise back up. I mean, don't give up. There's a time when there's anointing coming that will go out and raise the dead, you know, literally. And some of them, I have no struggle believing right out of their graves. To prove something to some people in this world, religious and otherwise. There's an anointing coming. You notice the apostles didn't go out and raise the dead till the anointing came. Jesus didn't raise the dead till the anointing came. There's an anointing coming. But you see, a lot of people are given up to death that wouldn't have to die. And I gave you the example in the beginning of the sermon where he never even thought. He said, I jumped down there and prayed for him to be raised and he was raised up and they were filled with madness and threw me out. But my point is, dear friends, that I hear the same lies and deceptions. I'm the teacher of these things. I've taught from every direction, every angle that's possible, the truth of divine healing. And yet when I go through a trial, the same old 
serpent that was in the garden comes up and hath God said, by Jesus stripes you're healed. God's not telling you all the truth. There's a tree over there called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why don't you go take a taste of that and you'll see your eyes will be opened, you'll be as God, and then you'll see that he's not always meaning best by his people because some do die occasionally. And of course, what you need to come back with, well, yes, it's given unto men once to die. That's scripture. But I just don't intend to be one of them right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, we have to overcome friends just like you. But there's some things where you get to the point where it's no longer a question. You just act. You don't give him an opportunity to plant the thought where it can take root. You just act. Logic, common sense. I would have gone sat down for a while to get my breath till the pain passed. Well, it didn't pass for three days at least and was intermittent for a week or two. So I'd have been wasting my time. I went on and preached the word and enjoyed it, praise God, and then had a whole group of ministers to counsel, and there wasn't any of them in there feeling sorry for me because you have to choose between sympathy and healing. But none of them walked in and said, shouldn't we just wait another night? After all, what you went through tonight. And so I wasn't about to say, why don't you wait? Because I was still hurting, hurting bad. But I didn't tell them that. And if they had said, wait, I'd said, no. Why wait? Well, praise God, it does work. And unless you think, you know, that some of us don't go through temptations, Jesus went through all that you go through, yet without sin. If he had to suffer them, why should you be isolated from testing and trial of your faith? Father, we ask in Jesus' name that the message of healing will be so impressed upon our hearts that there's no question of doubt or wrestling with the possibilities that it might not work. No, we can't explain what happens to some people sometimes. We don't question, we don't criticize, but we press right on with your word. Your word is true and you're faithful and we believe that you're going to vindicate in ways that hasn't even entered into the heart of man. You're going to vindicate your word in ways that will bring astounding glory to you. Hallelujah. So we're just going to hold fast and hang in there and believe you. We thank you. We really don't have a choice because once you've tasted the good wine, you don't want to go back to something else. The new wine is better. Hallelujah. In this case, the new wine is better than the old. When you tasted of the living bread, you don't want the chaff of man. So impress upon us the need not only of Settling the question about divine healing, even though we can't explain everything that happens, believe it anyway because your word teaches it, and also to take upon ourselves, each of us, the responsibility to give a good testimony, to make a good confession of faith, to ask the church to agree about things that do line up with the word, to do our homework, to think and to pray before we are so hasty to speak, thinking that because it's a testimony that that automatically glorifies you. Help us to be responsible. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, those who are going to serve the communion, come and just take charge.
I'd like to read a few verses of 1 Corinthians 11 before I read some others. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many have died. But if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And so we neither invite you nor forbid you. The Bible says that you are to examine yourself. That includes myself and all of us. And so let's just pause for a moment while you renew your covenant and commitment with the Lord and ask Him to remove any hindrance to fellowship in the communion between you and He, as well as with the rest of the body. Our Father, we stand in your presence simply by virtue of your mercy, your grace. With the knowledge our sins have been confessed and forgiven that they're under the blood of Jesus, it's by virtue of his work at Calvary that we now worship and Bring to remembrance what he's done on our behalf. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. We read in Luke chapter 22, where Jesus said to the apostles, With desire, I have desired to eat the Passover with you before I suffer. We shouldn't forget that he suffered as well as died. For I say unto you, I will not eat any more eat thereof until all be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. And then the other verses preceding those we had read previously in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul said he received a revelation from the Lord which he had delivered to the church at Corinth that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So, Father, we just remember his body broken in death for us. Father, we thank you as we do remember what he has done on our behalf. And we just lift up our hands and voices in praise and thanksgiving. In Jesus' precious name, we thank you for the bread of his body. Hallelujah. Praise God. Blessed be the Lord. 
Thank you, Father. Thou art faithful. Blessed be the Lord. Oh, we magnify your name for the provision you've made for us through the redemption of Christ, for the healing of the whole man, body and soul. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And after the same manner also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So we are to lift up his death, which the cup symbolizes in his shedding of his life's blood. Not only giving his life, but providing a cleansing from sin by his blood. Praise the Lord. Let's stand together and thank the Lord for what he's given on our behalf. Blessed be the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise be the Lord. Praise be the Lord. Hallelujah. Thou art faithful, O Lord. Blessed be Jesus. Thank you for your mercy. Truly be the cup of your Lord. Blessed be the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise be the Lord. Hallelujah. Thanks for the blood, the blood of Calvary. Thanks for the blood, the blood that set me free. Thanks for the blood, for your love. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for bleeding. for the blood thanks for your love thank you father for jesus thank you jesus for bleeding thank you spirit for leading me to the blood amen praise the lord praise god thank you for your healing mercies glory to god praise the lord Faithfulness is mercies. Blessed be the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Blessed be the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we do thank you for your faithfulness in all things which includes, most of all, the redemption you've provided in Christ. Not just the soul, but for the body. A full redemption, we praise you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Praise God.